Welcome to sensor number 135, entitled Feel the Burn, USA Exceptionalism, by William J. Eisenman, Ph.D. And before I begin, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures that it seems uh, Republican conservatives either have uh, censored out of their Bibles or can't seem to find them in their Bibles. Uh, approve all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that gives to the rich shall surely come to want. Proverbs 22 verse 16 he that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 28, verse 20. And as the nail sticks to the stone, so sin sticks to buying and selling. Ecclesiastes 27, verse 2. UNICEF ranks the United States 34th in the percentage of children living in poverty. In reading, our kids are number 17, and in science, they rank 20, 20th. In math, they are 27th. Our healthcare system ranks 33rd in the world. Inequality in America is fourth highest behind Turkey, Chile, and Mexico. According to the Happiness Index, we rank 17th. But don't lose heart. We are number one in people in prison, military spending, and the most gun deaths of any developed country. Presidential candidate Bernie Sanders is packing in the crowds. His campaign is only taking money from the little people. Yet Hillary Clinton and her surrogates are saying Sanders does not have the prosaic governing skills necessary to be an effective president. Does anyone remember the lack of governing skills we suffered through the eight years with G.W. Bush? The outpouring for Sanders is because he is hitting all the right issues. The ones practical politicians run from. After all, if the big Wall Street banks are supporting them, how can they say they would break up the big banks if they became president? Americans are discontented with government policies that favor the top 20% of us, especially the 1%. It has become common knowledge that this system is rigged. Our form of capitalism has failed 80% of us. To grow the middle class and lift the poor out of poverty, we need a high minimum wage and to make sure that normal wages rise naturally. Inequality should not occur. Within the 80%, there is a hunger for Bernie Sanders and his message. Many of us have finally come to understand that government is not the enemy. A lot of us are coming to the knowledge that socialism is not totalitarianism, and nor is it a bad thing. Some of us are aware of the other name for socialism, utopia. Tens of millions of us are finally demanding that our government work for us. Other industrialized countries can offer their citizens free health care, free schooling, and good jobs. These are true liberal positions, unlike the Democratic Leadership Council's positions throughout the 1990s that promoted tax cuts, no increase in the minimum wage, NAFTA, 
welfare reform, and tough on crime policies that left America with more people in jail than any other country in the world. Many pundits are calling Bernie Sanders' positions radical, and this is to cast his positions in a bad light. However, the word radical means to get to the root of things. A compliment, not a put down. We should not be calling Islamist extremists radicals. Many pundits agree that there is zero chance of Sanders' radical doctrines being adopted. They say the Congress will block Sanders at every turn. Sanders is called idealistic and that his universal health care is a pipe dream. Many say Sanders is a danger to Democrat, excuse me, Democrats because win or lose he won't be able to achieve his goals. But Americans are ready for bold proposals. If not now, when? Americans are tired of policies, politics as usual. In the primaries, this can result in a turn to the right or to a more progressive era. It all depends on us, the voters. Bernie Sanders is drawing in youths and Trump is getting new faces too. Sanders is a truth teller that is not beholden to Wall Street, corporations, or millionaires and billionaires. Many see Sanders as the candidate who can bring about a more just society. Others contend his goals are impractical. Yet if not now, when? Inequality, poverty, and a rigged political system are serious matters, and Sanders is calling for a revolution in order to get us to understand that this government is ours, does not belong to just a few. Good luck to Barney. The most important subject in the 2016 presidential race is the economy. But when it comes to the economy, most people's eyes glaze over and an overwhelming desire to sleep overtakes them. It is this attitude that has gotten us to where we are concerning the economy. While we were dozing, the bad guys took over. We ended up with a bloated federal budget, a huge national debt, tax cuts for the rich, and the robbing of the poor and the middle class. Crony capitalism prospered. President Reagan left us with a structural deficit. President Bill Clinton left G.W. Bush a surplus of $125 billion, while G.W. Bush left President Obama a $1.2 trillion deficit. Free markets and our democracy were corrupted. After 2007, 2008, financial meltdown, we learned that bailout, the bailouts were unnecessary. The meltdown was strictly confined to Wall Street. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley were economic predators. The public good was never involved. President Ronald Reagan began a military buildup that turned out to be a wasteful binge. So much money was thrown at the Pentagon that we saw $600 hammers and $900 toilet seats. Crony capitalism under Reagan amounted to about $1 trillion in today's money, and this was only in 1981. Reagan signed six tax increases to recover 45% of the revenue base after destroying it. In the Deficit Reduction Act of 1984, Reagan raised the Social Security payroll tax. The entire Reagan legislative program 
was a disaster. It raised taxes on the working class. There was full prosperity under Reagan. Between 1966 and 1979, the cost of living rose 125%. In 1971, a barrel of crude oil cost only $1.40. In 1975, it rose to $13 a barrel, while in 1980, it was up to $40 a barrel. The food stamp program has nothing to do with nutrition. It's an income transfer paid in alternative currency and it's only interested in full bellies. The national debt in 1913 was only $1.2 billion. But by the end of World War II, it was up to $260 billion. Unlike a good conservative who believes in smaller government, G.W. Bush increased the size and cost of government. In 1954, the deficit stood at $12 billion. Chicken feed by today's standards. President Eisenhower saw surpluses in 1956, 1957, and 1960. He was the last Republican president to preside over surpluses. Eisenhower balanced the budget without tax cuts as the top rate at that time was 91%. Warfare spending does not represent a true gain in national wealth. War spending destroys economic resources and diminishes consumer utility. The gains in GDP are a statistical illusion. GDP measures spending, not wealth. Yet every Republican presidential candidate is complaining our military has been destroyed. It's too small. We don't have enough ships in the Navy. Yet military spending is 57% of the budget. The U.S. spends more on its military than all other nations. The United States has 900 military bases around the world, and the Pentagon can't account for trillions of dollars, and the waste and abuse is tremendous. The Federal Reserve panders to Wall Street. It juices Wall Street speculators. In 1997, the capital gains tax was cut to 20%. At the same time, that at the same time, the ordinary tax rate was 39%. Under G.W. Bush, the capital gains tax was cut to 15% and the top rate was set at 35%. Then there is all this Republican talk about the free market. In the financial system, there is no honest free market. Monetary inflation deforms the financial markets. The Federal Reserve transformed Wall Street into a casino. Hedge funds and the like do not deal in a free market. Governments tax to pay bills. When taxes are cut, revenues go down. Each time loopholes are drawn, ordinary Americans get screwed. There is a loophole in our tax system that allows companies to move their headquarters abroad and avoid the Internal Revenue Service while they keep their executives in America. It's called tax inversion. Regulations like this rob the Treasury. Tax inversions began in 1983 when the construction company McDermott International 
changed its address to Panama to avoid paying for more than $200 million in taxes. A high-powered tax lawyer masterminded this scam. Also, profits are not taxed until they come back to the United States. That is, they are repatriated. This allows companies to hoard money outside the United States. Some billionaires and millionaires are giving up their citizenships to avoid taxes. Companies are hoarding $2.1 million trillion dollars in profits overseas. This is about $500 billion in avoided taxes. At present, few companies pay the 35% corporate tax rate, even though profits are up 21% since 2007. And corporate America's tax bill has fallen by 5%. Since the 1970s, government regulations have been disappearing lack of regulations allowed the 2007-2008 financial meltdown to take place. The Republican Party is the party of businessmen and financiers. The only regulations Republicans like are those that control a woman's body. Lack of regulations benefits the haves and the have-mores. These are things Bernie Sanders would fight against. There has been no economic recovery for Main Street. The Federal Reserve's printing of easy money has not helped Main Street. The Fed's monetary policy fuels speculative urges of Wall Street, not the economic health of Main Street. In 2012, the real jobless rate was 13% and more like 20%. Today, Main Street America is flat broke. The recovery benefited a small segment of Americans at the top of the economic ladder, the top 10 to 15% of households that own 90% of America's financial assets. It was a true recovery for the top 1%. For the rest of us, between 2000 and 2012, energy prices rose 100% and food prices rose 50%. Defense output contributes nothing of economic value and unnecessary defense spending is a waste. By 2012, defense spending was $700 billion. In most instances, defense spending is a government job producer. Private contractors use the Pentagon as a milk cow. It keeps them in business. President Eisenhower had a military minimum which in 2012 dollars would amount to $425 billion. Bernie Sanders would be making some changes at the Pentagon. The United States has a depleted revenue base. We can't keep getting shortfalls from the middle class and the poor. Pretty soon the rich and the corporations must pay their fair share. Each time there is a tax break for the rich, we pay for it. At this time, job growth is anemic, and we would be lucky to produce 7 million in the next 10 years. Adults not working will rise from 82 million to 113 million. Means-tested programs like 
disability insurance, unemployment insurance, and food stamps in 2002 cost about $160 billion, which by 2012 had grown to $270 billion. This did not happen because of more moochers getting on the dole. Eighty percent of Americans are hurting as the American economy continues to fail. Again, Bernie Sanders is aware of all of this. And none who are beholding to big corporations, billionaires, and billion millionaires, and Wall Street can or will change any of this. When you vote, vote smart. Vote in your own interest. Vote for Bernie Sanders and a real revolution. To get your own copy of Censored, Go to www.newslettercensored.com. The end. Welcome to How to Defeat a Conservative. Part number 13 by William J. Eisenman. This particular book was circa 1990s. This was complete integration of church and state. All of this fueled religious reformation. In 1369, John Wycliffe wrote a treatise challenging Rome's authority over the souls and minds of men. Martin Luther taught that the Bible was above the Pope. In 1536, William Tyndale was burned at the stake for writing an English Bible. There were many religious martyrs during the reign of Queen Mary, Bloody Mary. The first organized press censorship was carried out against the Puritans' religious pamphlets, which were considered to be illegal libels. Richard Cartwright preached that the state was below the church and that ministers were to have control of doctrine ceremony and public morals. These Martin Mar prelate directed against the Anglican Church reinforced feelings against religious dissent of all kinds. The general public and officialdom did not sympathize with the separatist doctrine of the gathered church, a community of believers bound together in a self-sufficient religious and social unit. The Stern Act of 1593 mandated imprisonment, banishment, and death for anyone persisting in this obnoxious course of action after the first offense. The struggle for religious freedom in England was waged by pamphleteers early on because newspapers, as we know them, did not come into existence until 1588. After each of the national Protestant churches established themselves, they persecuted other Protestants and Catholics. Even the colonists who settled Virginia made laws to persecute each other. In 1611, in Virginia, some capital crimes were failure to attend church services, blaspheming God's name, and speaking against the known articles of the Christian faith. Any man who failed to hold a clergyman 
in all reverent regard, was to be whipped three times, and was to publicly admit his crime, and that his punishment was just. Speaking evil of the king or the London company was punished by death. The pillory was used on those who spoke out against the governor or the council. These founding fathers of Virginia were not Christian enough to understand that God, the God of the Bible, created us free moral agents. Through repressive laws, early American Christians tried to mold the minds of their flocks into obedient sheep. Separatists considered themselves independent of the state in matters of religion. It was their duty to resist state intervention in religious affairs. Some separatists were called Brownists and independents. Separatists like John Copping Elias Thacker and ja John Penry, one of the writers of the Mar Prelate tracts, were hanged in 1583. The separatists aboard the Mayflower that landed at Plymouth Rock were considered to be traitors. They left England without passports and settled in Holland, and in 1620 they came to America. Their trip was underwritten by Thomas Weston and other merchant adventurers. For seven years they were to work in a communistic manner, and then all profits above bare subsistence had to go to the underwriters. The pilgrims chartered the Speedwell and the Mayflower to take them to America. But the Speedwell leaked and its passengers were crowded onto the Mayflower. Historians say 99 to 111 people came to America on the Mayflower, which left Plymouth, England on September the 6th, 1620. The voyage across the Atlantic Ocean took 65 to 66 days. They came ashore on Cape Cod and while exploring the new territory in a small boat, they found Plymouth Rock. The pilgrims came to America in search of religious freedom and to live comfortably. They also wanted to advance the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in the remote parts of the world. The pilgrims wanted their churches to be modeled along New Testament lines without regard to custom or tradition. They did not want bishops, deans, no sacraments except baptism and Holy Communion. They wanted no set prayer book, no ritual, no altars, no candles, no organs, and no incense. The pilgrims honored oaths and did not celebrate Christmas. When William Bradford was governor, Reverend John Lyford, who had been expelled from his Irish Episcopal, Episcopal parish for playing wolf with some girls in his congregation, tried to overthrow New Plymouth's government. Governor Bradford had formed an early FBI and read Lyford's mail. New Plymouth's government was not a democracy. Only free men were allowed to vote. Candidates for free men had to be sober, peaceable, and orthodox in, their, in the fundamentals of religion. Quakers and Baptists were excluded. There was no separation of powers. The church conducted political business in order to qualify as a deputy, a man had to favor suppression of Quakers. The pilgrims were religiously intolerant. They prosecuted others just as they were prosecuted in England. In 1642, there occurred an outbreak of crime among the pilgrims, and Governor Bradford's explanation 
is interesting in light of Wilhelm Reich's work on the function of the orgasm. Governor Bradford blamed the devil. He said, if streams are dammed up, they break forth with more violence, wickedness. Being here stopped by strict laws, it searches everywhere and at last breaks out where it gets vent. The pilgrims were not keen on free enterprise and did not gather wealth at the expense of others. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. Private property was okay, but its social duties and obligations were stressed. All industry was regulated, and the mill was a public utility and was not allowed to charge what the traffic would bear. Price fixing was important, and in Virginia the price of tobacco was regulated. Idleness was a sin. New Plymouth's government was an interfering and nosy type. Big religious brother was always watching. The Puritans came to America and settled at Salem, Massachusetts in 1628. John Endicott led the Puritans as Christians and men of God, the Puritans believed they had priority over heathens. John Winthrop believed it was the duty of his chosen people to rule. The Puritans blamed Satan for pathological or harmless acts, and libertines did not espouse any church, were punished. Among the Puritans, land was given to families according to need. The Puritans did not tolerate any forms of eccentricity. John Gatchell was fined 10 shillings because his hair was too long. Women were fined for wearing silks and Tiffany. Alice Flint was brought to court for wearing a silk hood. Church and state were united under the Puritans. In 1630, John Winthrop and his followers arrived in Charleston, Charlestown, Massachusetts. They later migrated to Boston, where they instituted a theocracy. These Christians were also intolerant. John Cotton said that democracy was not a God-ordained fit government for the church or the commonwealth. When Roger Williams arrived in 1631, he maintained that the Indians owned the land, and he advocated that women wear veils. The Puritans did not like Roger Williams. The Puritans did not like things out of the ordinary. They were the forerunners of today's right-wing religious conservatives. Salem's laws against dissenters were harsh, and the Puritans disliked Quakers, who were whipped and banished. All Quaker literature was burned, and some Quakers were mutilated and hanged. Luxury was condemned in Salem, and the Puritans disliked the religious competition. Samuel Gorton and his family of love sect were banished from plantation to plantation. They were whipped, put into irons, and forced to do hard labor. Anne Hutchinson, who believed in grace for, that, for what one was rather than what one did, was arrested and tried in 1637 for her beliefs. She and her children were banished. The Puritans were religious bigots. Alce Young 
was hanged for infernal practices in 1647. Margaret Jones was hanged for being a witch. Insane people like Dorothy Talbo, Talby, excuse me, were made worse by being whipped. She killed her child and was later hanged in Boston. Both Mr. Holder and Copeland had their right ears cut off in 1658. William Robinson, Marmaduke Stevenson, and Mary Dyer were friends who were hanged for rebellion, sedition, and undermining the government. The Puritans disliked happy children. They believed that good spirits in young boys were the sign of the devil and had to be driven out with frequent beatings with a rod. Puritan children grew up precocious, did not smile much. They had no toys and were not allowed to hear fairy tales. The children of the Puritans were always looking to do the forbidden. Several girls and a slave were thought to be bewitched and they in turn accused others of being witches. Some people were accused because they wore bright clothes. One of these was Brigitte Bishop, and she was hanged on Gallows Hill. Cotton Mather rode into town on his white horse to watch Reverend George Burroughs hanged. Giles Corey was crushed to death because he refused to be tried by the law of the land. It took three days for him to die, and as he was dying his tongue protruded, and the sheriff pushed it back in his mouth with his cane. Even Governor Phipps's wife was accused. He finally dismissed the killing commission and reprieved all who were still facing the death penalty. At this time it was taken for granted that the law and the commonwealth could do no wrong. When Robert Caliph wrote about these insane atrocities, Increase Mather burned the book at Harvard College. Today, religious conservatives assure us that their motives are pure. But increased Mather's motives were pure and sincere. However, they were pure and sincerely wrong. This was a time of little feeling and compassion. And when increased Mather's child was born with a birth defect, he blamed it on witchcraft. At this time, Wilhelm Reich's emotional plague ran rampant throughout New England. Insanity ruled. There was much sexual repression. The pilgrims saw misconduct nearly everywhere. Misconduct included an addiction to sports as well as robbery. Some historians claim that Massachusetts was not a theocracy because a man could not be a magistrate and a ruling elder in the church at the same time. They maintained that the influence of the clergy was unofficial and not sanctioned by law. But magistrates were considered nursing fathers of the churches. They had jurisdiction over all offenses involving idolatry, blasphemy, breaking of the Sabbath, the fitness of the clergy, and they rooted out all types of heresy. Puritan men who owned property were rarely punished with the whip. Drunken masters were sometimes punished, but the poor and servants were always punished. Thomas Maul, a friend, wrote Truth Set Forth and maintained in 1695 against the killing of witches and dissenters. 
The book was filled with slanders against the government and the churches. Maul was tried before the governor and council and was found not guilty. The court disliked the verdict because it represented an unprecedented independence of judgment. The Puritans detested individualism. The Puritans of Massachusetts Bay thought themselves as the chosen people of God. They were meant to create a pure church and a city of God in the wilderness. Like many religious conservatives of our day, the Puritans believed they had all the answers to life's questions. When people like Philip Ratcliffe spoke out against the government, they were arrested, fined, and whipped, and sometimes had their ears cut off by these noble Christians. When people ask why those who had done no wrong had to be treated like animals, General Dennison said that there is no room for both Quakers and Puritans. He maintained that now the power was in their hands and the strongest must fend off. In 1703, the general court made a public gesture of atonement for their wrong by voting indemnities to the heirs of those who had been condemned and executed. Many of the judges confessed that they had erred and begged for forgiveness for what they had done in 1692. The Puritans wanted to be the only church in town. Roger Williams rejected the idea of the divine right of government. He believed in individual freedom, the cornerstone of the American Revolution. An objective view of American history reveals that 1776 was not about Christian principles. It was about individual freedom and self-government. These concepts are not well understood by modern conservatives who whose populism is nothing more than condescending elitism. America was not founded on Christian principles. To be continued, the end.